Hey, my name is Brandon, known as Beyond Zen in my gaming community. And I tried VR for the first time in mid-2024. I was introduced to the Half-Life universe beginning with Portal in 2021. On my birthday of all days, I would later go on to play Portal's sequel and the many Half-Life adventures. Woo! There it goes! Much of this gameplay would span over a year's time and serve to refresh my memory on important events. As a big fan of the Half-Life universe, I set out to make Half-Life Alex my first ever VR game. So these must be highways or something. Look how fast they're zooming something. I didn't really know what to expect from VR outside of what I had been told. Vision rendered for each eye so that it creates depth perception. The closest visual comparisons I had were looking through binoculars or watching movies in 3D, but nothing could have prepared me for my first experience. Well, first of all, let's just take in the sights. Dude, it's like the microphone's actually, oh, she's, she's grabbing it too. It's actually like it's real. So I want to share with you my first VR adventure and what I was thinking as I played. Of course, there will be spoilers in this review, so if you have not played yet, or at least have not watched the gameplay, you've been forewarned. Don't say anything. Unlike Gordon, I'm not a man of few words, so make sure you've got your casserole out of the microwave before we begin. My god, what are you doing? There's so much I need to tell you. Half-Life Alex fully immersed me in VR, and if it wasn't for my small play space and cords running down my back, I probably would have forgotten I was recording a playthrough for you. Okay, we are recording. I love that the game allows you to pick up almost anything you see. Bye-bye! Oh, the physics! And that includes newspapers and memos detailed with information that add depth to the story. This is for that zoo. And the ability to upgrade my weapons, instead of just providing tons of them with static characteristics, allows me to strategize on how I best want to take down the enemy. I noticed that the combat was a lot slower in this game compared to other Half-Life titles. This was done purposefully to accommodate newer players like me. I know that this must have been frustrating to veteran players, but I really appreciated it. But now that I've played through the game, I wish that we had a mode that felt similar to the combat of the old Half-Life titles. Okay, dude, you're an old man. Keep up and don't die, okay? The puzzles, however, are well-crafted challenges. They are not so difficult that it slows your momentum, but it's also not so easy that you feel like they just gave you all of the goodies. I think that my favorite puzzle is the one you encounter to unlock the fabricators. It kind of reminds me of a star constellation. Overall, I think all the puzzles were really cool in their own little way, and I think they were tailored very well to virtual reality. Because you have to move your controller in a three-dimensional space, I don't see how it would translate very well to a flat screen game. I know that some would disagree, but I personally think that they made the right decision making this a VR-only experience. Oh gosh! Here comes something! There's something! Oh gosh! Is that bad? Oh gosh! Oh no! with pretty good confidence that I wouldn't have picked up VR had it not been for Half-Life Alex being VR only. If you can tolerate virtual reality, you should really give it a chance. Oh my freaking goodness, this is so immersive! This is so freaking immersive! I wish I had taken VR more seriously years ago. I love how it makes me feel. I guess I thought it was a gimmick, but I had no idea it was a whole other way to experience a video game. It's truly breathtaking to see all of the Half-Life world come to life, as though I literally stepped into this world I had previously visited so much on flat screen. I saw Fortigaunts, Combine Soldiers, Striders, Zombies and Headcrabs, Eli Vance, Alex's Hands, and even the streets of City 17. Nearly our entire journey is centered around getting to the vault, which supposedly held the Combine super weapon. But we find out it's actually a prison holding the most mysterious villain in the Half-Life universe, G-Man. Unaware of what she is doing, Alex frees G-Man.
Gordon Freeman? Gordon Freeman. <laughs> Miss Vance, you wouldn't need all that to imprison Gordon Freeman. So, who are you? Perhaps what I am is not as important as what I can offer you in exchange for coming all this way. G-Man reveals to Alex the tragic future of her father's death, the event we saw in Half-Life 2, Episode 2. Although Alex is presented the opportunity to save her father, such a decision will cost her dearly. I'm afraid you misunderstand the situation, Ms. Vance. Wait! Hey, wait! 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 She's <gasps> gone, Gordon. Oh, gosh, She's what? gone. There's unforeseen consequences. I knew it. One of my good friends said it best. Leave it to Valve to give us an ending that puts us right back where we left off. Because I knew this game was five years before the events of Half-Life 2, I never expected Valve to tie in the events surrounding the death of Eli. In fact, I was shocked. I was stunned. When I first saw Alex leaning over her dad at the end of the game, I thought the implication was Alex knew that her dad was going to die, similar to how earlier in the game, the Vort let it slip that Eli would die in the future. You will not save him. He is dead. No. -uh. What? Or it he will be. Is or will be? It is a matter of perspective. Initially, I wasn't sure how to process these implications. Did this give Alex foreknowledge of her father's death throughout the unfolding of adventures with Gordon Freeman in Half-Life 2? Or perhaps she understood it was only a possible path forward? G-Man certainly knows about altering time. It's in his nature. They authorize me to nudge things hmm. in a particular direction from time to time. What would you want nudge, Miss Lance? G-Man was truly as mysterious as ever and even more terrifying in VR. The spatial audio was incredibly immersive as he walked around Alex. The attention to detail on his character model is fantastic, even down to his tie he was wearing, in which its sheen made it all the more realistic. Even his suitcase meant business. Oh no, Alex, I don't know if you want this. Although I stood there and tried to do nothing, the game did not allow for an alternate ending. I kind of wish we had the option for an alternate ending, even if it was just for fun. I'll have more to say on the final moments of Half-Life Alex at the end of this video. Speaking of fun, as someone who branded his channel after the Zen world, I also found it a thrill to briefly see Zen itself while talking to G-Man. To me, the art style was a fusion of the original Zen and the Zen as seen in the fan-made game Black Mesa. It was simply magical and I wanted to see more of Zen in VR. I'm amazed at how much detail they've put in this game. Everything is placed to give the world its context and feel realistic. It truly feels lived in. Floors are wet and dirty, rats are everywhere, alive and dead. You'll find bedrooms, toiletries and lockers and bathrooms, food and cabinets, and all the furniture you'd expect to see in an apartment, but it's all in a dystopian context. When you choose to make a beautiful masterpiece such as Half-Life Alex your first full VR game, it's definitely a visceral experience. Ah! Gosh! No! Oh my gosh, that feels so real! No! Nope! 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 Crap! Ah! Okay, let's see. A friend of mine had been so eager for me to experience VR for myself, and now I see why. He was enjoying his experience on a much older Oculus. So I knew that no matter what headset I bought, I would have a lot of fun. So because of diversified financial goals at the time, I bought a MetaQuest 2 at its lowest price of 200 US dollars, plus its discounted accessories. And not one to miss out on any opportunity to entertain myself, I had a great time setting up the headset. Oh my goodness! Can you imagine the Quest 3 though? 
Seeing objects in a new 3D way was cooler than I ever expected. Really, to describe VR as 3D is kind of cheap because it's not actually 3D, but it's actually like you're physically in that world. You can perceive distances, scales of objects and people, and of course, depth. I love that word. It's kind of like lucid dreaming, if you've ever experienced that. You know you're in a virtual world, but yet it feels so real. Here we go. Oh my goodness, dude. Look at that 3D. The valve is like, it looks like it's close. Before the game even started, I sat at the title screen just to take in the atmosphere at the base of the Citadel. It's like I was actually there. Outside of playing Crisis, I had never before seen such realistic graphics. Couple that with seeing it as though it's actually in front of you. The spectator capture mode does not do it justice. What I actually see inside my headset does have a more realistic appearance, somehow. And I don't think it's just the depth perception. It seems that the spectator mode renders a slightly more cartoonish picture. Probably to save processing power, if I were to guess. Take my word for it. This game feels like real life when you first step into it. When I first saw the balcony fence in front of me, my breath was taken away. <gasps> the fence is right there! City 17 is down there, I guess. <sighs> a strider and everything. Oh my gosh, dude. A pigeon? It's right there. <sighs> I'm close to hyperventilating, this is so cool. It was my first time to see such hyper-realistic graphics in a virtual space. My brain just quickly became overwhelmed as it struggled to absorb all this brand new raw input. Now, since this was my first VR game, I chose to sit in my chair just so that I wouldn't fall over. My good friend had recommended me sitting down at first, but he had mentioned that you know, I'll definitely want to stand up at some point just because of the combat. And he was right about that. I literally tried to hunker down under a table just to shelter myself from gunfire and I could not get down far enough. So by this point, I was already several hours into VR and so I was already adjusted to the motion. So I just jumped right in. If you've never experienced VR, let me explain. Because you're moving in a virtual space, but your brain knows you are not physically moving in the real world, you can feel a little dizzy at first. So at the beginning of Half-Life Alex, I was adjusting to this new VR locomotion, while at the same time overwhelmed by the beauty of this new virtual world. That's why I miss so many of the little details, like throwing a can at the cat on the lower level or riding with the markers on the windows. It felt so new to me. It was like being a newborn baby, seeing a whole new world for the first time. Okay, oh my hand, this is freaky dude oh my gosh it's like high fidelity crap oh my gosh <sighs> <laughs> one combine mini reactor from a shipment of 4,000 they're never gonna miss it hearing Eli Vance with a new voice actor was a little jarring but I knew it was coming. With the passing of the original voice actor there was just no way they were gonna get the same tonal quality from Eli. Gordon thanks for everything you've done for Alex for all of us. Alex, on the other hand, was very convincing as a 19-year-old version of herself, in my opinion. I spotted the Combine moving supplies into the quarantine zone. That place has been deserted for years. Hmm. I really like how her personality shined through, and I really enjoyed listening to the conversations between her and Russell throughout the game. So, right now, what it's like to live on Earth on a scale of 1 to 10? <laughs> I'd say we're at a 2. Yep, could always get worse. What would you rate it before the comic showed up? I'd say six. Yeah, strong six. Six? That's not great. Well, that's life, Alex. You know, it's not always great. It was really nice to have a friend in the scary moments. What was life like before the combine? Ah, excellent. Alex, have you ever heard of a club sandwich? Uh, nope. Now, it was obvious that they used motion capture of real-life people because all of the movements and facial expressions looked convincingly human. And not just for the people, they definitely used motion capture for characters such as the Vortigaunts and Jeff. He will rip your arms off if he finds you. Oh, gosh. Climbing a ladder for the first time in VR was cooler than I ever imagined. Since I have no legs in this game, but only floating hands, being able to use my arms to move was a neat change of pace. 
Oh my gosh! That's how you climb a ladder? <laughs> but what would come immediately next was a little interesting. The game did a really good job of convincing me I was in danger when I first encountered the Combine arresting Eli. Oh, 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 no, no, no! It's cool! Hands up! Wait, 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 wait! I just, I just live here! Probably anti-citizens. Keep those hands up! Wait, 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 wait! Don't shoot! Very secure, He's totally here. So, the Combine did not appreciate Eli stealing a reactor and the information we had on those evil overlords. I instinctively raised my hands up, thinking somehow it would get me out of trouble. Of course, it did not. Wait, no, no. After Russell sabotaged the van in which I was held captive, I followed his friendly drone to encounter my second Strider jump scare. <gasps> Although this one was more of a surprise than terror. That first one really got me. Wow! It was amazing to see how big those things were. I could actually look up and perceive its size and distance towering over me. After climbing through a window, I found myself in a cozy living space. After a quick look around, I found my way to Russell's secret lab. It wasn't that hard to find. This whole section of the game is really cool, and I wish I had taken a little bit more time to explore Russell's lab. At first, I was intimidated by the Russells, or gravity gloves as we know them. It took me a while to get used to them and actually utilize them. For some reason, I have preferred physically picking up stuff instead of using the gravity gloves to pull them to me. But once I became comfortable with them, I found these cool looking gloves very useful. And not just for grabbing things, but also for health and ammo status. So after Russell and Alex formulated a plan to get her dad back from the clutches of the Combine, I was on my way. The handgun Russell gave me was awesome. It was the most realistic gun mechanics I'd seen to date. I had to insert the magazine, load it, and then aim the gun properly. No more point and click. It felt very lifelike for my first VR game. Encountering my first zombie was, well, not so lifelike. As graphic as it was, I was still impressed at its appearance as its blood glistened in the sunlight. Having the ability to peer inside their mouths and wounds made me keenly aware I was looking at 3D models and not just some camera trickery. It's neat how Valve fleshed out the health stations. It begs the question, was it always a squished worm that gave me health? I kind of feel bad for it. Or are they just those glow worms in episode two that hurt my ears? Man, these things screeching. <laughs> Shh, be quiet. It makes sense if they were. I'm just glad they're not so loud this time. It was freaky to watch the needles go into my hands, and even more so since there's haptic feedback in the controllers. The vibrations are cleverly timed to make you believe you're actually getting stuck. These health stations are amazingly detailed, and I'm curious to see what an HEV recharging station reimagined would look like from Valve. If they give us a Half-Life 3, I predict we will see that. I predicted all of this, you know. All of it. All of it. The zen-like ecosystem scattered throughout the game was a nice touch, and it really brought me back to the days of exploring the zen world in Black Mesa. The monsters were really well done, and because they feel more human-like, I kind of felt sorry for them. I began to wonder just how much of the individual is left intact underneath that head crab's grasp, something I hadn't really thought about before. A particular zombie at the zoo pointing at a child's drawing is actually very sad if you think about it. Like, what if that's their kid's artwork? That is a zookeeper after all. On a lighter note though, I am tickled by the zombie that has his finger pointing to the wall in the subway. It almost makes me wonder if he's like pointing to his destination, if the subway was in order. In the subway station, I came across my first combine fabricator. It took me a while to catch on to what I was supposed to do to unlock it, but once I did, I was thrilled to see that you could actually upgrade your weapons in this game. But according to my viewers, I unfortunately missed a lot of resin on my journey to the vault. So I didn't get to try out all of the upgrades before the end of the game. From what I've seen, the upgrades that I missed out on are pretty fire. I would soon meet my first Vortigaunt after accidentally solving his trapdoor puzzle. When he poked his head out, it was probably the most three-dimensional experience I had faced at that point. The texture detail of his skin was true to life, 
It made me believe he was actually standing in front of me. And of course, in classic Vort fashion, he proceeded to eloquently ramble on about the future. I just didn't expect such violence from a friendly creature. Dude really likes the taste of headcrabs, evidently. Hey, man. Watch out for them Vortigaunts. They'll kill you if you're not careful. Okay. Sustenance. Uh-uh. Uh, no, no, no. No, no. I'm good. I'll eat it later. Yeah, yeah. So, after not eating the headcrab which I was given, I continued on my journey to find my second weapon, the shotgun. Enemies were getting harder, so I needed something with just a little more punch. To get to that shotgun, I had to spin a pulley system with a bicycle tire and use a PVC pipe to hold its position. It's this way I would be able to reach the dead zombie holding the shotgun. This puzzle fascinated me. I guess it's because I had to use both of my hands to do two separate things to solve it. This made the game have so much more depth, and I'm amazed how natural it all felt. What's this? Oh, that is bullets! Here it goes! Crap, no! The shotgun was a helpful addition that packed a punch, but at a short range. Although I found myself trying it at longer distances anyway, only wasting the precious ammo I was provided. Holy crap and smokes, you know, skip all this! Even though I now had two capable firearms, I proceeded to allow flying head crabs to turn me into a screaming little girl. <laughs> oh no, what did you do? Oh! I swear when the thing is in 3D, it feels like he's actually gonna get you! And the darkness that followed made matters much worse. I don't know how normal it is for a man in his early 30s to still be afraid of the dark, but that's me. I hate the dark. I don't like going into the dark, and I especially don't like the dark behind me. A flashlight almost makes it worse. What is my light going to reveal staring right back at me? So I really had no problem reaching into the pocket of a creepy dead guy for a flashlight. It was using the flashlight in the cave behind me and the pathways that followed. I was soon enveloped by thick darkness with explosive barrels all around me, and I had to be very cautious to not make myself a tasty treat for these barnacles above me. Because of the darkness, it felt very claustrophobic. Oh, we're going outside. <gasps> oh, back into City 17, yo, look at this. Combine. Oh, West. Combine. These guys have automatic weapons. I'm gonna have to be really careful. Oh, whoa, dude, he's flinging. Oh my gosh. Ah, crap. Ah. Crap, shoot. After proving that my combat skills against the Combine still needed some work, I intercepted the train in which Eli was being transported. That whole train crash sequence was spectacular. <laughs> oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! Ah! Ah! Oh my gosh! I felt somewhat in danger as I watched it barrel past me into the wall, and I'm surprised that Alex wasn't injured by all that debris that fell. Dude, that was so freaking cool and scary at the same time. Like, I, that looked like that happened actually next to me. Right. Look for the president transport car. Check I got it. The front of the train. Whoa, crap, that freaking scared me. I'll find a way into the wreckage. When I climbed through the crash train cars, I found Eli hanging on for dear life. Give me your hand. Oh, man, this is freaking. Come on. No! When he fell, that shocked me because I knew he wasn't supposed to die yet. But thank goodness there was a Vortigaunt there to save him. Eli would be decrypting a combine data pod back at Russell's lab, while Alex would make her way to the vault for the rest of the game. I got my first view of the vault shortly thereafter. It looked so magnificent in the sky. I loved the lighting, and it just looked so big. A bit later, the game would introduce me to grenades and how to use them effectively. Now, it's worth mentioning that the shotgun has a grenade launcher upgrade, which does make it easier to hit your targets, one being because the grenades explode on impact. I know this firsthand because I've since had a chance to start another playthrough, and I can definitely see how having this upgrade would have been useful had I made it a priority. 
my first encounter with the Combine Heavies came in a surprise as he came out of hiding and without hesitation blasted me from the end of the hallway. Oh! Holy smoking boys! Shoot! Crap! Shoot! Get down! Get down! It was at this point in the game when I could no longer sit down in VR. I had to stand up. It was long overdue. The combat was getting too intense and I needed to be able to quickly duck for cover. This is when VR started to really level up for me. With a few hours of VR under my belt, surprisingly, I adapted rather quickly to standing up. I only briefly became dizzy, but it quickly passed, allowing me to keep going without losing my balance. Standing in VR was just truly a game changer, and it made the experience so much more immersive, and I only wished I had tried it sooner. Man, that was intense, man. It felt even more intense whenever I'm like standing up, though. As I reached the Northern Star Hotel, I oh, no, stood no, no, no. under one of the substations of the vault, and I just realized how small I was in this world, or rather how big this open world was. Just inside the hotel was a piano. Now, I took piano lessons when I was younger, so this part felt very special to me. But because I didn't have individual finger dexterity, I couldn't really do anything except hammer away on the keys. Well, I could kinda play chopsticks. They either sampled or used already sampled piano keys, because that's a real piano. And not only that, it actually sounded like it was being played in that room. My only critique would be that the keys appeared to be a little too long. Maybe I don't know my pianos as well as I think I do, correct me if I'm wrong, but they just didn't look to scale. The game would now take a creepy turn, with more zen habitation than I'd ever seen on Earth. Among this habitation was a plant-like creature that produced an unlimited amount of organic explosives called Zen Grenades. This creature reminded me of the enemies in Zen that impale you, and so naturally I tried to kill it. But thank goodness it's invincible. Some parts of the Northern Star had a relaxing vibe, so I didn't mind that. But others were straight out of a horror movie. I don't like this at all. Listen. Listen. Uh-oh. Whoa. This place is crawling with head crabs. There's probably an enemy or two. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I see lighting effects. Besides the poisonous head crabs, this place is home to what Alex calls lightning dogs. Although I see a stingray more than a dog. I would face more than one of these fast little boogers, and several of them would use dead zombies as hosts to cast bolts of lightning at me. And although I found their pattern predictable, that didn't take away the stress from these challenges. I definitely had to keep a close eye on my health, because it can quickly take you out. Ah! Oh no, I died! This creature felt so unique, and I really appreciate its addition to the Half-Life universe. It truly felt like nothing I'd ever seen before. And it's interesting that you encounter the creature here for the first time. An abandoned laundromat is just creepy to me, and the lighting in here makes it all the more ominous. And because of the setting, this creature has so many possible hiding spots, but it's open enough that if you stood at the top of the stairs, you can kind of see what's going on. Because this creature had so many hit points, I began to wonder if he was invincible until he finally shrieked and dissolved away. <gasps> it did die! It did die! Alex, yes! Alex, what happened? Even though I was confused on how to proceed next, I like to see how the devs forced me to think outside the box, as you had to use this creature's heart to power the door. It worked! I probably searched around for like at least 15 minutes. This creepy place is where I would find my third and final firearm, an unregistered combine submachine gun, and I called it my pulse gun. I really enjoyed using this firearm as it dealt great damage at a distance, but I had to be careful to conserve the ammo for more difficult enemies so I wouldn't run up against tougher enemies with only my pistol. It seems the devs purposefully placed the endless spawn of poisonous headcrabs surrounded in darkness just to tempt you to waste all that new pulse ammo. And it worked too. Oh shoot, he was dead already. Dang it. Once I reached the top of the substation, I could feel the power emanating from it. 
I did not realize how big it was until I stood before it. Like most puzzles in this game, I really had to think about how to disable it. But thankfully, Russell gave me the answer, and it was so cool. Uh oh, uh oh, yeah. Whoa! After I spectacularly disconnected the cables, I discovered the Combine was using the Vortigaunts to power their substations. The Vort was super grateful for being set free and vowed he and his kind would help me take down the rest of the substations. I loved the perspective of seeing him elevated above me as he gazed at the vault in the distant sky. His raised position felt symbolic of an upcoming victory, like a hero standing on top of a mountain with his fist held high. Uh-oh, I see what's happening there! Oh crap, in the- what? 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 Oh, shoot! Last one. Got you! You big boy! After defeating the waves of Combine soldiers dispatched to my position, the landscape began to change. Now, those who played this game know that when you start seeing the orange goo, it's about to go to a whole other level. So, it's best to enjoy the sights on the way. Oh, and look at all the explosive, dude! The orange vibrancy in this part of the game is almost comforting in a haunting way. It really would give off a nice ambience, if only it were not associated with the most terrifying creature in this game. Jeff. Jeff is a monster who lives in the city's abandoned distillery, our shortcut to the vault. Jeff is a bad dude, a really, really bad dude. He's virtually invincible. He has heightened hearing senses, but is blind. That is a detail that I missed in the dialogue when I first met Larry. He showed me the best way to deal with Jeff was to throw a glass bottle of vodka in the opposite direction that you wanted to go. But because I did not realize that Jeff could not see me, I spent a lot of my time crouching low, which really gave me a workout. Jeff is very predictable and pretty easy to work with once you learn his mechanics, but on your first playthrough, he is the most terrifying creature you've ever faced. <sighs> oh gosh. Be still. Holy crap. When I locked Jeff in the freezer, I thought I had him. I thought I was safe. I would open the elevator and escape, but I would quickly find out that in order to proceed, I had to get back into the room where Jeff was. So that meant I had to let him out. I can't describe the dread that I felt. I know we all felt in that moment of realization. Oh crap, he's locked though. He's locked. I don't want to. Get over there! Okay, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. Where's it going? Where's it going here, things? Oh gosh, why would you do that? It's doing this. That's, that, that seemed right. It made the, oh, shoot. Jeff hitching a ride on the elevator was not much better. Because of my vivid imagination, I really felt in danger. Remember how I said I don't like the dark? I also have leftover childhood fears about monsters. To this day, I still long step into my bed to avoid getting my ankle grabbed by whatever's lurking underneath. And when I have my back to something that's scary, my body goes into fight or flight. You know what's gonna happen? Let's go! Let's go! 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 Freaking go! <sighs> Go, 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 go. Oh, crap, freaking, 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 freaking! So much stress in this chapter. Thankfully, I'm eventually given the chance to exact my revenge on Jeff with a trash compactor. I can lock him in there! I can lock him in there, yeah, boy! We're gonna win this. <gasps> yeah, that's that boy! Watch this! This is gonna squish you! Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. It's ready. Once I restored power, I was able to open a tunnel, which Russell said would lead to the vault. I wasn't sure how that was gonna happen because the vault was in the air and we were going underground, but I just had to be patient and wait. I quickly realized I found myself in an antlion nest. They had made their home in and around the local zoo. This zoo had somewhat of a calming atmosphere. 
despite the Zen monsters lurking about. I hate all creepy crawly things. Compared to Half-Life 2, I found that the antlions were not so easy to kill. And I frustrated a few of you, so sorry about that. But in my defense, in Half-Life 2, I could just mow down armies of them by shooting them just anywhere on their body. But in Half-Life Alex, you have to shoot them in the legs and then their abdomen to get them to explode. I haven't played first-person shooter games years and years on end, so I wasn't accustomed to a game highlighting weak points on an enemy. Wait, I can shoot their legs too. I think I see what it is. Anything is glowing, that's what I can shoot, right? As I progress through the zoo, Eli continues to decrypt the intel he has on the Combine superweapon held within the vault. We find out it's more than a weapon, but a prison. And whatever's in there, even the Combine doesn't trust it. My journey would take me to a tall ladder to the outside, which had become one of my favorite parts of the environment to interact with. And now I would get to climb it for even longer. Oh my goodness, I can feel myself going up. Oh my goodness, I don't like heights and I can feel this. Oh my gosh, oh, it feels like I'm actually going up. What's gonna be here? What are we gonna see? At the surface, I watched as the last substation was taken down and the vault began to fall from the sky. Oh my gosh, it's falling, it's falling, dude! Alex, it's gonna come down! What the? Whoa, we just hitting a force field of something. Of course, it wouldn't be that easy because the Combine had a backup station, which immediately came online. I would now have to make my way to the tower to shut down that beam holding up the vault. Standing on top of that platform and watching that vault almost fall was so spectacular. It really felt like I was standing that high off the ground as I watched this thing just get closer and closer. And I was intrigued by the holographic barrier the vault fell into. It kind of reminded me of a fishing net. And I like its shimmery green color. It's probably a good thing it was there because it looked like I would have been killed by the impact. Oh, oh yeah! That's right! I mean, I almost fit the air when it did that! Antlions are coming! They ain't, they ain't giving up a fight. Here he is! Hit him! Oh, no! No! Mom! Stop! No! We're not done this! No, we're not! No, we're not! No! Oh, my gosh! I can feel them right here, boy! You do! They're huge! They're huge! Okay, let's see. They're in this thing right here. Of course! I can feel how big they are right here! Dude! It feels like they're actually on me! Holy freaking goodness gracious! God. After fighting through more hordes of antlions, I crept through tight dark spaces of a facility where a mysterious woman and a combine advisor held a contentious conversation. The identity of this shadowy figure is debated, but some seem to think it's Dr. Mossman. My initial thought, and I'm not alone according to Reddit, is that this was some multiverse version of Alex, perhaps an Alex from the future. It did kind of sound like her voice at first, but either way, because our team only hears part of this conversation, they think they have Gordon Freeman in the vault. Now, as we previously discussed, we know it's actually G-Man imprisoned in the vault, but not at this point in the game. They sure had me fooled though. I like how the game slowly reveals this as you progress, with this supposed revelation about Gordon just throwing you off the trail. After the scientist disconnected the call with the advisor, I looked through the reinforced windows into that communications room. I was really intrigued and I wished that I could have gone and looked around inside. However, the hideaway that would soon follow would be accessible. It felt so cozy and for some reason, I just loved the little plant over by the bed. And I was fascinated by all the little odds and ends, especially the lenses for the combine helmets. It's just something about the vibe in here that is just really inviting. It's in this Revelations chapter that, well, we learned that the antlions are being milked of their orange goo, but I'm still not clear as to why. The rooms with all of them hooked up to machines was very eerie, and it was especially creepy to see that one antlion suspended in a room all by itself, surrounded by all that apparatus. It was like straight out of a horror movie. I was reminded of just how much I shouldn't be here. I never did get efficient at killing the orange antlions, and the blue ones were especially hard for me because they were flying everywhere. I'm just not great at moving targets. I'm definitely going to need to practice more. Yeah, that's right, explode! 
There was the last, last one. one. Okay. Yes. Hey, Russ. That was much better. You want to swap in here? Check that out. Yeah. No, I would probably die instantly. Once I finally got past all the ant lines, I broke into some sort of facility and followed it through to the outside again, where I was met by more combine forces standing between me and that tower. Taking down the vault was amazing. That sequence played out just like a movie as Russell shouted at Alex as she attempted to dock the bridge to the vault by frantically pulling random levers. I'm not sure there was a right combo, but the game seemed scripted for the vault to come crashing down in the middle of the quarantine zone. Oh no! First, I thought I failed the mission, but then I woke up. It's amazing that Alex survived being in such close proximity to the impact. But as my grandfather, or Big Paul, always says, now that's just television. And you know it's also just television, Big Paul? A humongous three-legged arthropod-like combine synth waking up angry and start chasing Alex, shooting at her with its pulse gun. Since I didn't have an RPG on hand, I knew from the beginning that my little guns would not work against it, but that didn't stop me from initially trying. These arthropods are called striders, and they were scary enough in Half-Life 2, but seeing it chase you in VR is absolutely terrifying. They could have easily made the strider even more aggressive as you ran and ducked for cover in the ruins of the QC, but I'm glad they didn't. I was already nervous, as this was the biggest enemy I had ever faced in virtual reality. After running for what felt like forever, I reached a turret, a big gun that would let me take this thing out. I totally missed that there was this big blue shield protecting me from the Strider's small arms fire. It was also pointed out by my fans that I didn't have to crouch to shoot, but that I could stand up. That definitely would have made it a lot easier as without knowledge of the shield, I truly thought that the turret was there for cover while firing back. It took me several tries because the Strider kept knocking me out with its warp cannon. Okay, watch for the blue orb. He's about to do the blue orb again. I think. I think so. Wait, he's, he's died. He's died. I got it. After I finally defeated it, I was beamed up into the vault with Eli shouting after me on the radio to not go in. Evidently, he figured out what was inside the vault all along, but a little too late. When I opened my eyes, what I saw was not what I expected. I had been transported to this kitchen of a hotel cast in glowing emerald light. The nearly atonal soundtrack adding mystery to this otherworldly destination. I began making my way down creepy hallways and past a ghostly figure on a staircase. I followed the path which led me to my first sighting of the containment unit imprisoning the super weapon. Oh gosh. Holy crap. Dude. What is this place? Notice how it looks just like a bacteriophage, a type of virus that infects bacteria. I didn't realize the resemblance at the time, but I found a particular Reddit thread discussing G-Man's similarity to a virus. Very interesting. I'll link the thread in the description. At first, I didn't see a pathway forward, so I stood still to gaze up in awe at this massive prison before me. I didn't know what I was looking at, but it was spectacular to witness. And then I spotted it a light bridge above me. Now I've always been fascinated with light bridges in Portal and Half-Life 2, so the possibility of crossing one in VR got me really excited. As I progressed through the vault, it became disorienting very quickly as the rooms were turned in all four directions. This section reminded me of the iconic upside down staircase scene in the movie titled Labyrinth. I've never witnessed a more strange scene in a video game. I couldn't tell which way was up or down. 
I may be the only one who's ever thought of this, but when I was a kid, I used to hang upside down off the side of the couch in the living room and look up at the ceiling to imagine what it would be like to walk on it, just to experience something new. I've always been fascinated in unique ways, so although this part of the game was unsettling, I was secretly enthusiastic as I was living out my childhood dreams. I didn't say much regarding this feeling in my playthrough for fear of coming off weird, but now I'm realizing how fun it can be to discuss the wonders of our imaginations. And so, as I reflect on the floating silverware scene, I could also draw a parallel to being in zero gravity as an astronaut, and that's another childhood dream of mine. So I wish this scene lasted a lot longer than it did. So although all of this was weird, it was sort of calming in a strange way. As I played, my mind was set on these phenomena and ghostly figures, in which I was sure that it pointed to G-Man's involvement. So, who do you think these ghostly figures are? Do you think it's G-Man in his former days? Or an unfortunate soul caught in the wrong place at the wrong time? Because of the relatively calm atmosphere, I doubt any of us were expecting the eruption of a particular hallway floor. Ah! Holy freak! It had been a while since I had that sort of jump scare and squeezing past the floating zombie was kind of creepy too. Um, okay, I'm just gonna go down here. Just going down here, I guess. Yes, we are, okay. After dropping down into a lower level, I exited into a bedroom and peered out the window to see Combine soldiers setting up for an ambush in the building next to me. This reminded me of the scenes at the end of Half-Life 2. I thought sure they were there for Gordon, but I saw no one. The Combine just held their positions. I can only theorize that they were waiting for me. I came to a hallway which curved downward. As I approached the end of the hallway, I temporarily became a little dizzy because my brain had become convinced I was standing on a declining floor. It was really weird. In fact, this place got weirder and weirder. On the floor below, I witnessed mirrored images of the rooms, projected where the ceiling should be. Except that when I grabbed a floating ashtray, the mirrored one above me stayed on course. Everything not tied down in these rooms were soon sucked out, and not out the bottom doorway, but the mirrored top one. The tornado outside! Uh-oh. The way out became clear, into the blue nothingness. Oh, I guess we're going this way. I wouldn't normally. I arrived at some sort of containment area with multiple rooms. It was sectioned off with soldiers on the other side of the doorway. I noticed green energy planted inside the walls, and I initially thought I would have to remove all of them to escape. But I learned that these would supercharge my gravity gloves, just like the gravity gun at the end of Half-Life 2. It felt so cool to blast the bad guys with my gloves, even though I struggled to aim well. Thankfully, the game is pretty forgiving. I felt like a superhero as energy eliminated one soldier at a time. I'm gonna grab a couple of these for the road. Yes, that's right, I'm so powerful! You can feel the haptics in this, it's like vibrating like crazy! I thought it was a nice nod to what we saw happen with the gravity gun without being too much of a copycat. They just, they just supercharged my gravity gun. Grenades must be the bane of my existence because I did not fare well with them at this stage either. On this particular day, I had been in VR for over two hours, which is a long time for me personally, especially when entertaining for a camera. I could tell by the way that the game was building up that it was about to be over. So even though I was really, really tired at this point, I kept going. Come on! Man, this is so freaking awesome! I feel like an adventure! Yes! <laughs> when the fighting was finally over, I made my way across the light bridge that I had so hoped to cross. The light bridge! We're going across the light bridge, dude! Yes! That light bridge looked so beautiful in VR. And I was so distracted by the figure inside the inner containment field that I completely missed the second light bridge leading to it. I know that figure, that's, that's G-Man's figure. I knew in my gut that it was G-Man, 
But when I got an achievement saying I reached the super weapon, I second guessed myself. I had been led to believe that the super weapon was Gordon Freeman. But as I drew closer, I knew without a doubt it was G-Man. And the green structure around G-Man looked so cool in the creepiest way possible. The music which accompanied this moment added to the ominous atmosphere. And to look in on G-Man, imprisoned within his cage, felt surreal. They had him. But I was about to let him out. It's one of those moments where you don't want to do something that the game is clearly directing you to do. Our character Alex would soon find out it was not Gordon Freeman she was rescuing. Oh gosh, that is totally G-Man. I told you. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. To see G-Man face to face in VR was creepier than it has ever been. His character model looked the most realistic than it had ever been. His facial movements felt more human-like, and his attire looked like real fabric. G-Man's ear even glowed from the light source shining behind him. And because of the game's spatial audio, I always knew where G-Man was, no matter where he walked. Even if I turned my head in another direction. What was really trippy is when he appeared to split into multiple entities. The audio felt as though it came from all directions at once. In a strange way, I kind of wish the interaction with G-Man was a little longer, simply because I was so impressed with his sequence. G-Man boasts about being able to nudge events in the timeline and asks Alex what she would like to be nudged. This was clearly a trap set for her. After G-Man informs her that getting the Combine off Earth would be a considerably large nudge, the deal he offers Alex is so sinister. I can't even begin to imagine being shown the death of your father in the future and being given the choice to save him or not save him. What kind of decision is that? It was disturbing seeing, in high definition, Alex holding her father's body in her arms. Now, I love seeing games remastered for today's technology, but this was the most heart-wrenching scene of Half-Life. Well, besides when Alex herself nearly died when she was impaled by a hunter. Now that I was seeing this event in more detail, there was little left to the imagination as just to how horrific this was as his blood pooled beneath him. Even though Eli's death was being played in reverse, it was still just as brutal seeing Eli in the clutches of that combine advisor. It also felt eerie to see the advisor itself in higher definition. I didn't get a good look at their mangled bodies after the train crashed, so this was the most detail I had seen of them. So what would have happened if she chose not to free her father? Would she have been released and Gordon remained in stasis instead? But we all know that G-Man knew what Alex would choose. Kind of like when G-Man told Gordon, I have recommended your services to my employers, <laughs> and they have authorized me to offer you a job. Otherwise, I can offer you a battle you have no chance of winning. Time to choose. It's two bad options. Alex didn't know the gravity of her situation. Wait! Hey, wait! 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 I was so shocked at what I had just witnessed, and it all happened so fast that I was trying to process everything. I'll be honest, I was worried that my recorded reaction wasn't going to live up to everyone's expectations because I just stood there in disbelief. But I realize now that I think we all had a similar reaction. I'm not sure what I was expecting for an ending to Half-Life Alex. I knew it couldn't touch the events of the rest of the games if it were to be canon, but it's clear that Valve found a clever way to weave Alex's backstory into the most heart-wrenching part of the series. I'm relieved that Eli's death is undone, and we're given a chance to save Alex once again. Now I wonder if Valve will ever give us a Half-Life 3. Dear Valve, 
I don't care if you make your game only work with your Index Mark II, or whatever makes you finally release Half-Life 3, I will buy it. Just please make it. Or just tell us you're actually working on it instead of just leaving us in the dark. It's clear that Valve set this up perfectly for Half-Life 3. After the credits roll, we hear Eli's voice as he desperately tries to awaken Gordon from his injured state. Vital signs, critical seek, medical attention. Gordon! Gordon! Wake up, Gordon! She's gone, Gordon! She's gone! Seeing Eli alive, face to face, where he once lay dead felt so surreal. This hangar is where his massacre took place. That scene is etched in my mind. And now we're seeing him imploring Gordon. Of all the voice acting we've heard up to this point, this sounded the most like Eli Vance. When I realized I was in Gordon's body, I wondered what would come next. I'll be honest with you, this is the only part that kind of got spoiled for me. It was before I ever even started the game, but I accidentally ran across a comment that said, we get to play as Gordon for like 30 seconds, lol. Whenever I see a potential spoiler like that online, I always try to talk myself into believing that it was a joke. But I knew that it wasn't. So when the credits started rolling, I knew I had to wait because I knew there was an end credit scene. I just knew it. I mean, at least I was hoping that there were these few moments as Gordon. I guess it wasn't really a spoiler because I didn't know about any of the events surrounding Gordon. That's literally all I had known. So I guess that's pretty good for being late to a game by four years. Now, even though I didn't react to seeing Dog in the background, I believe they did a wonderful job with him. Everything from his worn out body parts to his warm glowing eye, he felt more real than ever with his physics feeling just as playful as ever too. I feel he translated very well to a more realistic art style. And watching the scene back, I noticed how the helicopter bounced whenever he jumped onto it. That helicopter and the light shining in behind it, by the way, looked freaking amazing. With the iconic crowbar in hand, Dog passed it to Eli, who gave it to our hero. A D-sharp note ringing out as Gordon grasped the cold metal tool. And this is where the game leaves us to speculate on the events which would follow. If I looked to my left, I would have spotted our overarching antagonist, G-Man, as he spied on his former recruit. That's so eerie that he was there and I didn't know it. So thank you to my community for letting me know so I could go back to re-experience this in a new way. I've always loved playing the hero in video games, and that feeling is so much stronger in virtual reality, especially in a game that looks so realistic. I geek out about lighting reflections because they really add to the high fidelity textures that we see, but just to see how they've improved the realism of the characters as they spoke and moved around is just simply fascinating. But it's not all about the visuals. We could have the most beautiful game in the world, but if the story was boring, who would care? Thankfully, Half-Life Alex is not like that. In my opinion, I found the backstory of Alex and her father compelling, and the writers did so well to keep me invested in what would happen next. As a new Half-Life fan, I can't imagine what you guys have gone through as you have waited so long for a Half-Life 3. I've only been waiting for about three years Y'all been waiting for so much longer. So should we even expect a Half-Life 3 after all this time? Well, with the way that they ended this game, it's gotta happen. But I don't know, maybe I'm giving the data mining and supposed leaks too much validity. But if Valve does release a Half-Life 3, I can't imagine it being a VR only title, not after all this time, because it's one of the biggest anticipated titles of the century. And so to alienate a large portion of their fan base, I feel it would be a mistake. Although, VR or non-VR, you can bet your hazard suit I'm going to be playing it. I'm eager to see if your old suit still fits. Well, I'm all out of time. Now, if I missed or glossed over an experience or opinion, please let me know, and I'll be thrilled to discuss it with you. Thank you so much for being here and staying till the end and letting me know your thoughts. And thank you for subscribing as you await my next VR playthrough video. Stay vigilant. <laughs>